pleasure to introduce Jay Ansel, who you are familiar with, you know, from various uh, uh, um, conferences he has attended. Um, I will tell you about Jay, that he has been playing music professionally since he was a teenager. He has toured throughout North America and Europe and has performed in a wide variety of musical genres, from jazz to rock to bluegrass to classical to traditional music from America, Britain, Ireland and Catalonia. He even played with a goth punk band for a while. He has worked extensively as a composer for theatre in Philadelphia, New York, most notably with the playwrights John Buer, Laura Eason and Lee Brewer. Right, but apart from being a wonderful musician, he is also a great raconteur. And now he's going to tell you all a very good story. Mm. So I leave you with Jay. So, huh? so I'm so I want to start with some autobiographical information to sort of put everything into context. So I was born in Philadelphia in a suburb called uh, Elkins Park. And I was the, there we go, that's my house. Uh, I was the middle of three children. My mother, uh, on the surface, was a very typical suburban Jewish housewife. Huh? There we go. Uh, but as the early 60s evolved into the late 60s, she became a sort of hippie, radical, anti-war activist. Huh? Boy, I can't get this button to work. Uh, and uh, at one point, we had our house painted by members of the Weather Underground. <laughs> My father uh, was an artist trapped in the body of a businessman. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't particularly good at either of them. Uh, my parents separated when I was about eight, uh, but reconciled after about nine months when my mother was diagnosed with a severe case of rheumatoid arthritis and decided that her life would be more stable if she stayed uh, with her businessman husband and her three children, but not a far under the surface. She resented all of it. A couple of years uh, before that, when I was six years old in 1968, my parents uh, took me to, and my brother and sister to a bee-in uh, at Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. Uh, it was basically just an outdoor festival featuring lots of psychedelic music, and I have this vivid memory of hearing music that was so beautiful that it made me feel filled with a sense that everything was perfect. This was the right moment, and the right people, and the right sounds, and the right colors and smells, and everything felt so exactly right that I burst into tears, and that everything I've ever done creatively uh, has been an attempt to recapture that moment. And I'd say there have been little flashes of it here and there, but I know it can never happen, and I know I can never stop trying. Ultimately, my father's failures as a businessman, he was a clothing store owner, caught up with him, and when I was 17, he suffered a complete nervous breakdown and spent a couple of months in a mental hospital after a suicide attempt. Uh, he had put the family so deep into debt that my mother had to sell our house, and this time they split up for good. As I grew up, I was told many times that I was unusual in so many different ways, both good and bad, that it became a sort of identity that I cultivated. I sought out interests that nobody knew I sh that nobody I knew shared, such as origami and uh, the plays of Ionesco. And this need to feel different from everybody also became most evident as I became more and more interested in music. I'd been forced to take violin lessons starting when I was nine. Uh, but by the time I was 12, I'd had enough. And when I was 14, my friend Emily, who was a couple of years older than me, taught me some chords on the guitar and I became obsessed. But lots of people played the guitar. I needed to be different. So for my 15th birthday, I got a banjo. And I started taking lessons in Philadelphia with an 83-year-old man called Edgar Stanistreet. Uh, he was a tiny old man. He was uh, and he was hunched over, and he was the most amazing person I'd ever met. He'd worked with Leopold Stokowski in the Philadelphia Orchestra, and traveled with Picasso playing improvised mandolin pieces based on converting the values of light into the values of sound. And I loved hearing him tell stories at least as much as I enjoyed learning to play. And thinking about it now, I think that this was the beginning of a pattern of seeking out mentors. One of these mentors was a guy in Philadelphia that I knew who worked at a store that sold kites. And one day, I was, he was looking at a book on the Woodstock Festival, and he showed me a picture of the Incredible String Band. Now, I know a lot of you will know who they are, but among 15-year-olds in suburban Philadelphia in 1976 or so, uh, they were completely unknown. Uh, he told me that this was right up my alley, and he actually gave me the money to go and buy one of their albums. 
Uh, this changed my life. I describe it as being like that moment in The Wizard of Oz when they step out of the house and the film suddenly goes from black and white to technicolor. And one of the members of the band, Robin Williamson, had been touring with his own group, and the night I saw them perform, I decided that I wanted to de dedicate my life to being a musician. A few years later, I saved up money to buy my harp, and I met Robin Williamson uh, when he was playing in Philadelphia. And by then, I'd already been playing fiddle and mandolin with a band playing square dances and become a bit of a fixture in the Philadelphia folk music scene. And Robin and I had an immediate rapport. Uh, uh, this is at, uh, at uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, and when I told him that I had ordered a harp, he said, if you're going to play the harp, you need to learn about the bardic tradition. So first thing, you must read the White Goddess. So I ordered a copy from my local bookstore and I got about 60 pages into it before I realized that I had no idea what I was reading. <laughs> I knew practically nothing about folklore and mythology, particularly Celtic myths, and even less about poetry. Although, having discovered albums that featured Brian Patton and Roger McGough, who fit into my unusual schema, uh, I was actually way ahead of most of the people I knew. So this was my entry in. One night my girlfriend at the time and I were in New York and I found myself talking to a songwriter who I wanted to impress. And when he mentioned that he and his girlfriend were reading the Odyssey to each other, I bragged that I had been reading The White Goddess, although I think I'd only made it to about six, 65 pages by then. He said, Graves, I've always wanted to read the Claudius books. So the next day I went and I got a copy of Black Claudius. <laughs> I couldn't put it down, and after that I read everything that Graves wrote that I could get my hands on. And my girlfriend told me uh, that she mentioned my new obsession to a friend of hers who was a college professor, and he said, oh, Graves is the one who was with that crazy woman who jumped out of the window. So I had to find out what that was about. And Martin Seymour Smith's biography of Graves had recently come out, so I found a copy and read that. And this was how I first learned about Laura Riding. As you know, Seymour Smith's portrayal of her was, to put it mildly, not flattering. Uh, but I was kind of fascinated by her. His characterization was so outrageous that I immediately took her side and assumed that the writer had a personal issue with her. And somewhere in there, my girlfriend and I broke up, and I met this very cool, short-haired art student named Claudia, uh, and convinced her that if she went out with me, one day I'd take her to a castle in Spain. Uh, it took a while, but we became a couple. <laughs> the very first thing that we did as a couple was to take a bus to a bookstore in Jenkintown, where I had ordered a copy of Laura Riding's selected poems in five sets. Of course, I was completely baffled by it, but I wasn't bothered by that. I was baffled by a lot of things. I kind of assumed that uh, that was part of the point. But there was something that impressed me. I knew that I didn't know what the poems meant, but I also knew that Laura Riding knew, and she wasn't kidding around, and that in itself appealed to me. I could figure it all out later. Then one day in March of 1983, I was back in Elkins Park with a couple of hours to kill, and I decided to stop in at my local library. And I found this gigantic reference book called something like Contemporary Poets, and each entry had a biography and a few examples of each poet's works, and an essay by or about each poet, and I looked up the poets whose names I knew, Graves, of course, and ultimately Laura Riding. Her entry had an essay that, I had, that uh, she had written that I didn't have the patience to read, but I noticed that at the end of her entry in the book it said P.O. Box 35, Wabasso, Florida, 32970. It seemed like an insane idea to write to her, but the possibility of making contact with the real person, THE Laura Riding, the crazy woman that jumped out the window, it was too tempting to see what would happen. The only question was what to write. The night that Robin Williamson told me that uh, I needed to read The White Goddess, he performed his own setting of Graves' poem, Alley, and inspired by that, I sought out poems that I thought I might be able to set to music. I didn't have any specific Laura writing poems in mind, but it seemed like a good in to ask if she had any thoughts about the idea. I don't have my letter to her, so I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but I said that I had come across some poems of hers and that I mentioned something about Robin Williamson, although not that he told me to read Graves. Uh, the letter ended with something like, I hope you are well and to hear from you soon. And about a week later, after I wrote that letter, I got a call from my mother. I was using her apartment as a mailing address because I was kind of in flux at the time. She said that I had a letter from someone named Mrs. S.B. Jackson. I didn't make the connection at first, but it wasn't until later that night that it hit me. The crazy woman had written back. Uh, this one, like many of her letters, started out talking about her poor health. Uh, uh, I am indeed rather unwell. Uh, and, uh, and that she was writing back soon because she was afraid that if she didn't, she might not get to it. The entire first paragraph addressed my sign-off, I hope you are well and to hear from you soon. She explains her, re she explained her reasons for not wanting to combine music and, and her poetry. Uh, 
And she said that it would distance her meaning force of the words to a remove of unrelatedness to their pur pur purposed sense. <laughs> she acknowledged my mentioning Robin Williamson as an example of what I thought was a successful merging of words and music. She was interested in that and the fact that he was Scottish and she mentioned that she'd been in touch with the poet Edwin Morgan and that she'd gotten a recent book of, her, of uh, Morgan's and uh, even had written his, uh, his publisher's address on the letter in case I wanted to contact them. She also mentioned that she'd been thinking about revisiting something she had written years before that touched on music. And the letter finished with, let this suffice for the time being, I shall not forget how kindly you have written, Laura Jackson. Well, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting that, like an actual response. It was eccentric, but it certainly wasn't the insane ramblings that I was led to expect from the woman described in the biography of Graves that I'd read. I decided to respond and push back about words and music. I mentioned Bob Dylan as an example of someone who effectively used music to make his words more forceful, and the work of George and Ira Gershman as an example of using words to enhance the music. In my memory, I think of her response to that, particularly the mention of Dylan, as being really vitriolic, but looking at it now, it wasn't as bad as I remember. She mentions the idea of performance as being an unfortunate development, or as she put it, a disordering behavior pattern and was not happy that poetry had been so much given over to it. And I think that that was her main issue with Dylan in the context of my letter to her. And to be honest, despite being a performer myself, I have a lot of ambivalence about performance, and I don't entirely disagree with Mrs. Jackson here. In that letter, she promised to send a copy of her book, The Telling, which she published in 1972, and is probably the most concise uh, expression of her worldview. It arrived a few days later, signed and with a little handwritten note, explaining that it was the U.S. edition. She also said that she had entered my address into her little book and would keep me in mind as someone who was interested in new editions of her older publications as they were being republished. This seemed like a happy conclusion to our little correspondence. I had gotten more than I expected from this little project, a couple of truly eccentric letters, a good feeling between her and me, and a free book. <laughs> but I couldn't resist. I had to bring up Graves. So I lightly dipped my toe in the treacherous waters of mentioning him. I think I said that I had seen a reference to some books and learned that she had worked with Robert Graves, which I imagined would have been interesting. I also mentioned that my father was living in Fort Lauderdale and that I occasionally went there to visit him and that perhaps sometime when I was in Florida, I could come and meet her. Her response was pretty remarkable. First, she explained that because of health reasons, she couldn't promise to be available for our meeting uh, ahead of time. So she included her unlisted telephone number and said that I should call when I was in the area. And if she, and if she felt well enough, She'd be, she'd be happy to meet. She wrote about the books by T.S. Matthews and Martin Seymour Smith saying what you might expect. You could feel how hurt and betrayed she felt by Matthews underneath the anger about it, and she had nothing but contempt for Seymour Smith. She wrote a bit about Graves correcting my phrasing by saying it, quote, could not be described as my working with him. <laughs> but she offered a perspective that seemed like her honest appraisal of the years that they were together and the way that my mother's version of the events of her life with my father and around their split differ wildly from my father's version, and both are probably what they really experienced, but I'm not going to say any more. Uh, she ended the, the letter by saying that she didn't wish to discuss Graves any further, but had wanted to correct my impressions of their association. And the final sentence was, I feel goodwill toward you, although we are far from meeting in our courses of thought. Now to some, this may seem a little dismissive, but to a 23-year-old who had no idea what the hell he was doing in the world, that felt like I was being taken seriously by someone, someone of real substance, and it meant the world to me. A few months after this, I came across a copy of T.S. Matthews' book, and I was not prepared for what I read. It would be an overstatement to truly call Mrs. Jackson a friend after just these two letters. But my experience had been really positive. Plus, I had been absorbing, which is a more accurate uh, word than understanding, her poems and the telling, and I couldn't recognize this person in Matthews' description. And it was genuinely upsetting, and my first reaction was to feel defensive on Laura's behalf. Just like with Seymour Smith's book, I had the opposite reaction from what the author intended. This made me want to reach out to her and, I don't know, make sure that she knew that not everyone who was contacting her was some sort of literary gawker at a literary freak show. Uh, I felt ashamed that my initial inclination to write to her was to see what the crazy lady would say, but she had changed my mind. In my next letter, I wrote about having read these books and how horrific it must have been for her to have these things out there. I also asked out of genuine curiosity about whatever became of the dictionary that was begun with Graves in the late 30s and about where it might be possible to find other books by hers. 
I also mentioned that there was a good chance that I'd be in Florida in the next month or so, and that I was still hoping that we could meet. What I didn't tell her was that I was really only planning on going in hopes of meeting her. Visiting my father was just a ruse. Uh, in the letter, I included a photo of me playing the Celtic harp at a festival in State College, PA. You can see that she signed, she wrote on the back, who I, you know, who it was. Um, uh, thinking that she might be interested in seeing what I looked like. This, I believe, marked a turning point in our relationship. She wrote more about Matthews and Seymour Smith and the latest with the dictionary, which had become a much different project of larger scope about words and was pretty much uh, ready for publication. She asked what books of hers I had and offered to send me the ones I didn't have. But she acknowledged the photo saying that she was, uh, of course, interested to see how I look and said, I like that you thought to give me this opportunity. She discussed a bit more about the possibility of meeting, but reiterated that she couldn't promise that she'd be well enough for it. Then, at the end, in parentheses, she said, Long, long ago, I owned a harp and took a few lessons on the playing of it, but other things stayed that pursuit. So there's a biographical detail that nobody knows. Yeah. Laura Riding was a harp player. She was one of us. <laughs> and she ended with, I'm grateful for your good feelings toward me. And the next to it was a handwritten word, believe. Plans came together for a trip to Florida to visit my father, wink, wink. Uh, and I screwed up my courage and called her on the phone. Her first reaction was surprise, as she expected that I would wait until, until I actually arrived in Florida to call her, but I misunderstood what she meant, and uh, I just called to give her the dates of the visit. It was a pleasant but short conversation, but I got to hear her voice. I saw it described recently as sounding like Margaret Dumont from the Marx Brothers movies, but my first thought was Glenda the Good Witch from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, I was surprised by how giggly she was, and found that kind of endearing, but I was also really intimidated. I called the morning after I arrived in Florida, and Laura was, was just as giggly, but more nervous, it seemed to me. She said that uh, I was welcome to come for a short visit, but that she couldn't provide a meal, and that she gave me directions to her house, up the coastal highway to Vero Beach, then Route 1 into Labasso, and then uh, left at the traffic light, uh, drive a short distance over the train tracks, and then turn right into a little la a lane covered with vine and palmetto, and then the clearing would be the house. Uh, she said just to come in and uh, find her in the main room. It was that easy. There's a famous legend in the Seymour Smith book that tells of a fruit distributor on the road called R. Graves Fruit Distributor, with a sign that she could see from her bedroom. But when I was there, it was called Graves Brothers. Uh, and it wasn't that close and not at all visible. I found the place. I walked in through the front door past the little rooms on the right and left. The left was her bedroom, and the right was the room where she stored all her books and beyond that was the bathroom, and into the main room, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, I lost myself, uh, where she was sitting at the set small table uh, waiting for me to arrive. The house had no electricity and the walls were very dark wood and the only light was what came through the windows. But there was Mrs. Jackson, her hair was uh, white with a little baby blue ribbon in it and her skin was so white that it seemed to me that it glowed and her eyes were the most intense blue I'd ever seen. Her physical presence took me aback. I can't explain it, but I wasn't prepared for it. And she could not have been more gracious. The first thing she did was ask me if I'd be willing to run to the local convenience store and buy her a little bottle of ginger ale. And she took out a small purse and gave me a few dollars and said to buy one for myself if I wanted. I remember feeling a strange sense of having stepped into a different world for a minute and then having to step back out into the real world to buy a bottle of ginger ale. And I kept wanting to ask the clerk at the store, do you know? <laughs> I promised myself that I would remember everything we talked about and everything we said, but of course I can't. But I was struck by how easy it was to talk with her. There was never a lull in the conversation. We touched on pretty much everything. We talked about her life in Florida, as well as in Mallorca and England. I remember uh, we talked about all the usual names being mentioned, Graves, of course, Hart Crane, Virginia Woolf, Gertrude Stein, D.E. Lawrence, etc. I remember talking a bit about Dylan Thomas, who she said had contacted her in Graves about publishing his first book but said that she found it too wild. And she seemed puzzled by the suggestion that she might regret having missed the opportunity to publish Dylan Thomas. At one point she mentioned a secretary in Mallorca and I said, Carl? And she lit up and said, yes, Carl. And the obvious thought suddenly hit me. Even though I had read all these, all about all this in a book, she was not a character in a book. She was a real person and so was Carl Gay and so was Robert Graves and everybody else. We sat at the small table at the south end of the room, and there was a pile of papers that was three or four inches high. And at one point she mentioned that this was the dictionary that she had worked on with her husband on until he died in 1968. 
and uh, she had finished herself recently. It evolved into a more comprehensive book about language and the meanings of words, but there it was. I almost leaned on it with my elbow. In the weeks before the trip, I wanted to feel well-versed in her work, particularly the telling. I found this book really fascinating and that it started out being pretty graspable by me, but it took a little while before I felt like I'd gotten lost. And by that time I became invested and wanted to get it. I remember having one of those flashes that people describe where suddenly you can see the entire thing in front of you and it all makes sense. The key to the book is memory. And in thinking about these ideas in the book, I was coming up with lots of ideas on my own about the connection between music and memory. I believe there was a po it was possible to create a kind of music that could surpass all of one's preconceived ideas about genre and trigger one's deepest sense of memory beyond our individual selves into that space where we're all connected. I think that's what I was experiencing when I was six at the BN. I talked to Mrs. Jackson uh, about this a lot, and she had some really insightful thoughts about it, although they were hard to follow, and I don't think she agreed with my thinking. She was only attached to words as a vehicle for every kind of true communication, but she took it all very seriously, and these ideas popped up in subsequent letters, and I was very touched that she referred to this conversation in an essay that she published that was called Body and Mind and the Linguistic Ultimate. We also talked about my life and family. My late teens had been pretty turbulent, and the events of those times are why my father was living in Florida with his new wife instead of at home with my mother. Uh, she showed me her work desk and her typewriter, and she opened a drawer that had some photos in it. I remember that one of them was uh, her and her husband in Hot Springs, Arkansas in the 50s. And I remember seeing this portrait of her in three-quarter view that I think is the picture that made her look the most beautiful. Uh, I asked if there was a copy I could take, but she giggled and said she didn't have one. Uh, I was always surprised that this photo didn't ever seem to be published, and we almost only ever saw that unflattering profile that accentuated her Jewish nose. She also showed me her husband's desk and the 13-volume OED on an inset shelf that was built specifically for him. Uh, she walked with a long metal cane that was taller than her, and at one point she said, if you ever need to walk with a cane, you should get one that's taller than you, because you can, you know, you just use it to hold yourself up. Otherwise, you have to lean, lean forward, and it's a strain on your back. And before I left, she asked me to go into her storeroom and bring her a few specific books. And I stole a look at some early editions and saw the copy of her first book of poems, The Close Chaplet, signed uh, with love to her father. She gave me a copy of the new edition of the 1938 collected poems and a copy of Progress of Stories. She was hesitant to give me that one. She said she didn't think I'd get anything out of them. But uh, that's become my favorite book of hers, and probably one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, she didn't expect to spend as much as an hour with me, but I was there for almost four hours. And I think she might have allowed me to stay longer, except her voice was becoming strained. She refused to allow me to take a picture. Uh, and as I drove away, I tried to sneak a picture of the house, but I mostly got a nice view of the back of my father's car. Uh, when I got back to Philadelphia, I sent a note to let her know that I had arrived safely and to thank her for her kindness. In her response, there was a significant difference in tone and one very subtle but important change. She called me Jay. I asked her if I should call her Laura, and in her next letter, which began to Jay, and then Jay with an exclamation point, a greeting which would begin, would begin many of letters after this, she said, I don't know if you can see it, she said, indeed you may call me Laura. First names in one form of use of them are names of trust, and signed it Laura. In that letter, she referred to an upcoming, uh, I referred to an upcoming lecture, oh no, sorry, she referred to an upcoming lecture in the University of Delaware that I had mentioned. I had heard uh, this, uh, about this from a friend who was a student at the university. One of the English professors there was giving a lecture on the life and work of Laura Riding, and I thought she might want to know about it. She was very interested and very anxious. It was obvious to her, based on experience, that the lecture would be, uh, would use the Seymour Smith and Matthews books as the main source for biographical info, and this was very upsetting to her. She also wanted to know uh, what was to be discussed regarding her work, uh, as she felt many people got it wrong, and she was likely to be misinterpreted and poorly represented, especially in the context of being talked about as the caricature discussed in those books. She wrote to the president of the university asking for a copy of the lecture in advance, but received no response. It's easy to feel she was overreacting when it came to things like this, uh, but I don't know how I'd react if I had been the subject of a book like either of those. Uh, as the day of the lecture drew closer, Laura asked me to attend and let her know how it went. And shortly before the date, she did hear back from the president who explained that the professor was working from notes and that there was no way to send uh, the text of the talk. This made her more nervous and convinced that she was going to be ripped apart. Uh, 
And Newark, Delaware is a short drive from Philadelphia, so I drove down and attended the lecture. It was pretty much what was to be expected. It wasn't exactly hostile towards her, but it rehashed the usual stories and talked about how difficult her poems were. And at the end of the lecture, the professor told the students that Laura Riding had sent a spy to watch the talk and that he'd like to talk to them once it was done. I didn't like being referred to as a spy, and I didn't like the implication that Laura was some sort of paranoid cult leader who had, sent, who had henchmen all over the world ready to beat down anyone who said a bad word about her. So to make peace, I introduced myself to him, and we went to get a cup of coffee. I don't know what he was expecting, but I know it wasn't a 24-year-old hippie fiddle player. <laughs> I wrote back to Laura that I had met the professor and that we had a nice talk, and that uh, I was disappointed that he leaned so much on the biographical sources. Uh, that she had assumed, uh, that uh, she had assumed, and that she spent so much less time discussing the work. He had spent less time discussing the work. But he did have a lot of respect for her work, particularly Progress of Stories, which I appreciated. She was still very upset about it. She continued to press the university for more information about the text of the lecture. Eventually, the, the professor responded and sort of threw me under the bus, saying that I was very friendly and that I liked the lecture and that uh, we had a very nice talk afterwards. During this time that we were in touch, Laura's letters always began with the exclamation point after my name, so it was a bit notable when a letter arrived in early January with my name and two asterisks. I can't quite describe the tone of the letter. It was chillier, but there was still some affection. The gist was that uh, it had become too much. She said, the best at this point in regard to our, your and my relations is that they be terminated before they become overcolored with this unfortunate episode. At the end, she said, let there be peace of clothing. Uh, 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 what has taken a cheerless turn, this relationship that began quite promisingly as it seemed and signed at Laura and then under that she wrote Laura Jackson. I was shocked. I called her on the phone to see if I could talk her out of it. It made no sense. Her attitude seemed that she was just as sad as I was, but that she saw no other way. She wasn't angry with me. She just wanted it all to be out of her life. The week before I got this letter, one of my oldest friends had been found in his bathtub having died from AIDS, which he had kept secret from everyone. He was a television writer living in Los Angeles, and I met him when he was my summer camp counselor when I was five. He was the first person I knew closely who had died. The same day that Laura sent me the termination letter, I sent her a letter about my friend and told her how devastated I was by the loss. Our letters crossed in the mail. My letter also touched on a few other things, among them her plans for cataract surgery, which were complicated by several factors, mostly due to the fact that she lived alone in a house with no electricity, which would make it difficult for someone to stay and give her the round-the-clock care that she needed. I had a possible lead on someone who might be willing to help, so I gave her that information. So I believe that this reminded her that I was first and foremost a friend and that I was looking for her friendship and offering mine and that the University of Delaware business was peripheral to me at least. A week or so later I heard from her. The letter began encouragingly with an exclamation point once again next to my name and she touched on all the points in my letter expressing gratitude for my concern regarding her surgery and my offer of trying to find someone to help during the recovery. She wrote about the loss of my friend and spoke of the current AIDS horror um, in terms of our responsibility for being human beyond being bodily entities, which is, I believe, how she saw everything. And she touched on the University of Delaware situation by saying that she's decided to stop pursuing it any further, but promised that if anything new should arise, she'd let me know. And she ended with, the sense of this letter, of my attitude towards the strains that, uh, that have arisen in our relations, is wait, wait. And signed it, as with her previous letter, with Laura and then Laura Jackson. I always felt a little ashamed of this episode. I didn't like feeling that I had let her down, and I didn't like feeling that she could throw away our friendship so easily. Years later, Peggy Friedman uh, told me that Laura had at one point cut off correspondence with her, but ultimately Peggy became Laura's authorized biographer, so that made me feel better. A few weeks later, Laura sent me a carbon copy of a letter from the president of the university. She'd apparently gotten some satisfaction from them regarding the lecture. Our friendship resumed as if nothing had happened. Maybe resumed is not the right word. Our friendship really flourished at that point. The only real complication in our friendship at this point was that she started writing her letters by hand and they were nearly impossible to read. I wrote about more personal and conversational things uh, and her letters started including the word love in them in her sign-offs. I shall be thinking of you with loving gratitude toward for your fidelity, for your 
fidelity of feeling toward me. Greetings of and wishing of love I send you. My favorite was at the end of a letter which she, uh, in which she wrote about her frustration with a lukewarm, a lukewarm review that was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is my local paper, and written by a local writer named David Slavitt. Uh, the words she used was dismal, and at the letter ended she said, I am sorry that Philadelphia has its uh, David Slavitt, but it has its J. Ansel, and that is anti-dismal. <laughs> Greetings with love, Laura. Another opportunity to go to Florida came up, so uh, Laura and I made arrangements for another visit. This was much more casual meeting, so I don't remember as much. But I remember a few things that were interesting. The first thing was when I asked her how she was, she replied, well, I'm desperate, but uh, I don't mean desperate just for me, I mean for all of us. And shortly before the trip, I had miraculously found an old copy of Anarchism is Not Enough in a small used bookstore next to the school where Claudia worked. Uh, I, brought, I brought her with me for her to sign. I remember that she thought about what to write for a surprisingly long time, and that her hand hovered over the page while she considered it. She also gave me two cassette tapes of her reading some poems with an introduction. The other thing I remember was that we were interrupted by a visit from a man called Tom Herring, who would stop by and bring Laura her mail. He was an older black man, and Laura seemed overjoyed to see him, and he was happy to see her. They clearly had a really nice friendship. Beside bringing the mail, Tom brought news of mutual friends, and I remember that uh, one friend was in the hospital in Vero Beach, and Laura had given Tom a book to bring to her friend to read while in bed. It wasn't one of her books, I forget what it was, but an old book of popular fiction that Laura had at the house. This was notable. Behind the chair where I was sitting was a bookshelf filled with novels, not anything that might be considered literature or even bestsellers, just books that to read for fun. Uh, none were books I'd ever heard of. Tom reported that the friend loved the book, and Laura laughed and punched at the air and said, I knew she would, uh, and went to get another book. Uh, it was another nice reminder that Laura's life was a life that was filled with real people that she knew and cared for, and not everybody was a literary hanger-on or a frustrated writer with a bone to pick. And Laura, for all of her seriousness, even her jokes were serious, and high-minded linguistic acrobatics, was also someone to the people that knew her in her community. It was just a lot of fun. I don't know if Tom knew anything about Laura's life before Florida, the notorious, emotionally volatile and incomprehensible poet who scandalized the literary world in England with her sexual promiscuity and who leapt from a window and after destroying a marriage escaped to Spain with her lover where she became the megalomaniacal dominant figure in a circle of writers and poets and that she hung out with Lawrence of Arabia and Virginia Woolf and Gertrude Stein and that she met another married man and drove his wife insane so that she could have him all to herself before running away to Florida and disappearing and that she was to be the subject of several books and a play and a movie. Uh, he just cared about her and he enjoyed seeing her so he brought her her mail. We continued to exchange letters regularly. Claudia and I tried to translate them uh, and uh, write them down in a notebook, but I can't find the notebook. But the gist of the letters always came through. During this period, uh, Claudia and I moved to the outskirts of Philadelphia and started making plans for our wedding in June of 1988. Laura was happy to hear about the plans and was appreciative to get an invitation. Huh? Uh, there's supposed to be a picture of our wedding here. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> you disappeared. <laughs> yes. Uh, one thing worth mentioning is that it was important to Laura for people uh, that she knew to connect with each other. And when I mentioned that I'd be touring in a certain area, she'd give me contact info for friends. And several of these people have become dear friends of mine. On March, 9, uh, March 14th, 1988, my mother died. The years and years of steroids that she had take, uh, taken to make her arthritis bearable and destroyed her ability to, to heal. And when she developed a perforated ulcer, it never was able to heal. And ultimately, she just let go. She was 50 years old. I wrote to Laura about it, and she called me to talk about it. She talked to me about suffering. She talked about the importance of it, that it was something that one needed to, to experience, something that one needed to go through in order to progress in one's life. Unfortunately, I was so wrapped up in everything that I couldn't take it all in right then and there, but I thought about it a lot as time went by, and I wish I could remember everything as she said it. It was so perfect, and it was so much something that nobody else had said. My paraphrasing of it doesn't do it justice. 
Part of the fallout from my mother's death in combination with my upcoming wedding was that my family went crazy. It's all way too complicated and stupid to explain, but it was all consuming for me. Uh, uh, and I wrote to Laura all about it. There was one particular event that was causing me a lot of anxiety, which was meeting with my brother and sister to divide my mother's belongings. She didn't have anything of real value, but there was a lot of stuff, and it promised to be an emotional bloodbath. And the day before this was supposed to happen, I got a call from Ted Wilentz. Ted and I had been in touch before this, but uh, this was the first time that we actually spoke. He was a member of Laura's board of literary executors, and probably her most trusted friend at the time. He lived near Washington, D.C., and had developed a great reputation as a bookseller, particularly known as the co-owner of the legendary 8th Street Bookstore in New York, where he was known as the older brother of the Beat Generation. Laura had explained to him everything about what I was dealing with, as she, and as she didn't feel after writing or talking, she asked Ted to call me and let me know that she was offering support and that I mustn't let things get to me. Later, later Laura wrote something that she called a hymnal for my family, uh, which she asked Peggy Friedman to type up and send to me. Um, Peggy had been helping Laura with all sorts of things, and ultimately, as I mentioned, uh, was authorized by Laura to write her definitive biography. Peggy, as well as Ted and his wife Joan, continued to be dear friends, and I have Peggy to thank for encouraging me to write this paper. In several letters, she sent her best wishes for the wedding uh, that June, and in December, Claudia and I traveled to Florida together for my third and last meeting with Laura. By this time, she had 24-hour nursing care, as she was now dealing with heart problems. We went to see her a few days after Christmas, and as a gift, at Peggy's suggestion, I gave her a copy of Stephen Hawking's recently published A Brief History of Time. According to Peggy, Laura read the entire book in a single night using a flashlight and a magnifying glass. And she later wrote a response to the book, which was printed in a volume of Chelsea magazine. Laura was particularly happy to meet Claudia for the first time. By now, many of her letters were addressed to both of us, so she had already counted Claudia as a friend. And for the first, first part of our visit, uh, Laura would interrupt every few minutes and say, every few minutes, and she'd say, and you're Claudia, with a big smile. Uh, there are two things I remember most about this visit. One was that I brought with me a portable cassette player and a tape of my new album, which had been recorded but had not yet been released. I played her one of the tracks, a quartet written for Celtic harp, cello, oboe, and soprano saxophone. And before I played it, she asked her nurse to come in. Her nurse was a very shy, young African-American woman, and Laura wanted her to hear the music as well. As the music played, Laura moved her head to the music and smiled. And when it finished, she asked the nurse what she had thought of it. She was very nice. Uh, uh, Laura said, uh, I understand that you're trying to find a new voice with your music. And I nodded in agreement. And then she said, well, now that you have a voice, you must say something. The other thing I remember is that she had been working on some definitions for children. The words she was writing were, the, the definitions were the word history, story, tale, fable, and truth, with additional definitions of poem and poetry. She was trying to define them as simply as possible as to make them understandable by children, and since she knew that Claudia was a school teacher, she wanted Claudia's feedback on them. Claudia and Laura read through each one, and Claudia made a few suggestions, which Laura wrote down. She was still working on the definitions for poem and poetry, so she had Claudia write them down on the page, discussing every word as they went. Over the next year, our correspondence came more through Peggy and less, uh, less frequent, Laura turned 90 in January of 1991, and I called to wish her a happy birthday. Peggy was there with a few others, and I got to talk to Laura, who was having a great time, but a bit overwhelmed by everything. Birthdays are hard work, she said. On September 2nd, 1991, I got a call from Peggy, who was at Laura's house. Laura had died earlier that day, and she was buried next to her husband in a local cemetery. And Peggy sent me a little copper plate that Laura kept on her desk. In June of 1992, Claudia gave birth to our daughter. There was never any question that she would be named Laura. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>